Hi, this is Professor Brennan. I'm here today and we're going to talk about communication and close relationships. And this is for my interpersonal communication class. And we'll be focusing on the family. We'll be focusing on friendship. And we'll be focusing on um, romantic relationships. And we're going to take a look at that. And probably this video is going to end up in being three or four parts by the time we're finished discussing. So this is part one. Let's go to the PowerPoint. Hope you're all doing well. Okay, here we go. Communication and close relationships. So when we think about close relationships, for you, the first thing I think about is intimacy, right? If we remember that communication is a driver of all relationships, right, of all relationships, not just close relationships, but of all relationships. So if we know that, then we know that if we are having a close relationship, communication becomes even more important, right? If you don't have communication, how is it you're going to have a close relationship? How does that happen? So when we think of the word intimacy, if we were in class right now, I'd be writing this on the board and I'd ask you to come up with words to make you think of what's, what is intimacy. And I have a few of my own, so we're going to go with it. So I think the first thing I think of is love. Then I think of sex. Then I think of connection. Oftentimes when we think of intimacy, what is intimacy, right? It's really, I mean, maybe we can even define that as a class what you think what do you think is intimacy there are words usually to describe it but intimacy is kind of like a feeling that you have right it's when you're when you there's usually and actually this word isn't even in there but you there's usually trust right in order to have intimacy you have to have trust how do you get trust you get trust from knowing the person from the person showing up and being that same person all the time right having that being their same person their same personality so we do trust happens over time. We don't just get it immediately, but we have to put ourselves out there first to get that intimacy and to feel that closeness. And if you remember what we talked about early on in the beginning of this class, we talked about our need for other people. It is, it is a lie to tell ourselves that we can do this alone or we're loners or any of that. That's a lie because honestly, for our own survival, and we're not just talking physical survival, that's important when we're young, but it does affect our health. If you remember that too, we talked about that. How our health, people who are lonely or depressed are often are lonely people, right? And it does affect their health, not just their mental health, but their physical health. So intimacy can feel like bonding, right? It can feel like companionship. You know, I'm just coming up with my words. You, you create your own words of how you describe intimacy, right? It's touch. And it's through disclosure, right? We get intimacy, there's that word, I'm bringing it back to communication. It's through disclosing who we are. That's how we feel close, right? And want to spend time and are able to allow ourselves to be physically touched, even if it's just a friendship, right? You know, if you have a, uh, uh, women especially, we're used to being close. We can be like, our arms can be touching each other. We're just have a platonic relationship, but it's okay for us to be, put our arms around each other, hold hands, link arms. We are, uh, we are uh, comfortable with physical intimacy, right? But that comes from emotional intimacy. And men and women are different this way, and we'll talk a little bit about this later, but men and women are different. Men are usually driven, they get intimacy through sexual, through a sexual relationship. That's how they get intimacy. Now, I'm making generalizations because you could be a, a woman, a female, who gets intimacy through sex as well. But generally speaking, women, men seek intimacy through sex. Women seek intimacy, seek intimacy not through sex, but they get intimacy from the time before you have sex, that connection, that's what leads them to want to have sex. But they need to, usually, generally speaking, women need to have the connection first. Hence right? They always talk about the battle of the sexes, right? Of how uh, the differences between men and women, um, how they get along, you know, those different needs. 
But knowing that can help you in your relationships with other with your with your opposite sex partner. Okay, let's keep going. Come up with your own ideas of intimacy. They're not limited to this. I am not the uh, the doctor of intimacy and know all the words to intimacy. These are just words I came up with. So I don't got the handle on it. Let's keep going. Intimacy in its dimensions. I'm going to be using uh, this movie called Little Miss Sunshine. If you haven't seen it, it's a fantastic film. It's so sweet and so filled with touching Ah, oh, well, how do I want to put it? These experiences that they go through, they go on this journey, literally on a journey for the youngest daughter. And the journey is filled with, it's a comedy, but it's also a drama. So maybe it's a, how do they say, dramedy? Um, it's fun. It's hilarious. Each character is very well developed in terms of each family member is pretty well developed. They have their own personality, but you can see how they all connect and they all need each other. And so I'm going to be using this particular film to kind of connect how we talk about family communication in a minute. So intimacy and its dimensions. What do we mean by that? Well, obviously there's physical intimacy, right? Where you're physically close to someone, right? There's that word closeness. There's intellectual intimacy. What does that mean? Well, intellectual intimacy is to be able to share ideas, to feel safe. You know, hopefully you have this experience in your classrooms. Hopefully you have it in this classroom where you feel safe enough to share your ideas, share your opinions. Um, this class is more emotional than it is intellectual, but oftentimes, like if I have argumentation class, I'm teaching that. I try to create an intimacy where people can actually be comfortable enough to intellectually share what it is they're thinking about or their ideas or their opinions or their values. Uh, but intellectual intimacy happens between professor and student, happens between students, happens between people that you're having, uh, could be your co-workers. Emotional intimacy, that's the thing that most of our, us are familiar with, right? That happens between friendships, it happens between parents parents and their children, uh, that feeling of love and companionship and care for someone, that's emotional intimacy. To be able to share our feelings, be able to say, you know what, I feel really crappy today and my feelings are really hurt because you said this the other day and I can't get over it, right? That's emotional intimacy. When you trust someone enough to say, hey, this is what's bothering me. And then finally, shared activities. They create, that's another dimension of intimacy. Think about this. If you've been on a team before, then you know there it's intimate, right? You've been in a sports team. You played, I don't know. Um, I'm thinking about when I was a swimmer in high school. I was on a team. And it's definitely, I mean, it is related to your activity. And, and sometimes friendships develop out of that. But this, when you're on a team or when you're doing something, shared activities, it becomes intimate. What if you're hiking together or you're climbing a uh, half dome or whatever you're doing, their intimacy does develop, right? A bond does develop from that shared activity. There's a closeness as a result of that shared activity, whatever it is, which happens actually in this journey of a family that's kind of uh, disparate, uh, yeah, disparate or disparate in their activities in their lives. And this journey actually brings through the shared activities, the shared journey brings them together. Let's keep going. So these are the dimensions, physical, intellectual, emotional, shared activities. So we're looking at family communications. We're going to look at the characteristics of family communications, family communication as a system, and then we're going to look at communication patterns. So when we say characteristics in family communication, well, I'm again using this, the movie Little Miss Sunshine, because it kind of is, represents the family is a system and it shows the characteristics of all, how all those individual members experience and share in that experience of being part of that system. And each has that individual personality, like in a family, each one has, everyone has their own personality and they create a greater whole. What I call a whole is like a gestalt, like gestalt means something that's full, that's fully itself. Families create a gestalt and that all these little pieces fit together perfectly. You may not think your family fits together perfectly, but in its own way, it fits together exactly the way it's supposed to fit together. Okay. 
It's formative. First characteristic of a family. Man, the family shapes you. The family is your shaper. Whatever family that you grew up in, whatever that looks like, whether you had two parents or one parent and a grandparent, or you had an aunt or your uncle or your grandparents raise you, or you're a foster kid and you had more than one family, whatever it is of your life experience, someone was there. You know, you wouldn't have made it to college, I'm guessing. You had someone of some authority, some kind of parental caretaking figure in your life that helped you get to this point in your life where you're in college and you're, you know, working towards something that you want to do. And so it is formative. It forms our identity. It helps form and shape our identity. It helps form and shape our personality. It guides our behavior. It tells us like it, it tells us uh, the family forms like what's right and wrong, right? You could grow up in a family. If you remember that video we watched about the the young woman who was a white supremacist and then later changed to become anti-racist, right? If you remember that that little short film that we watched, so she grew up in a family that told her to be racist. Right? Those are the values she agreed to them. That's what she was indoctrinated in. So you could be indoctrinated in that, or you could be indoctrinated in a family that's not that way, that believes that, that your family tells you every person, whether you're white or a person of color, or however it is, every person has a right to be, everyone is, you should respect everyone, everyone has value, right? Your family has something to do with how you think about things. Ultimately, as an adult, you're going to make your own choices, but they are forming and shaping those parts of you, what's right and wrong and how you think about it. And also, lastly, the most obvious thing is your family gives you your traditions, right? They could be traditions that everyone has, could be the tradition of, of celebrating Thanksgiving, or maybe you don't even celebrate that. What if you're an indigenous person? You're like, I'm not celebrating Thanksgiving. So you celebrate Indigenous People's Day or you celebrate your indigenous tribe, whatever those beliefs are during that time. Or um, let's say you're Jewish, you celebrate Hanukkah and the Jewish New Year, which is Rosh Hashanah and, and uh, Yom Kippur, those eight days. Or you celebrate, uh, there's different holidays in Judaism. And those kinds of things, those traditions, and there's always food involved, right? So if you're a Christian, you celebrate Christmas, maybe you celebrate, you celebrate Easter probably, uh, you celebrate, think of other Christ holidays right now and they're not coming. Maybe, uh, not Passover, but, um, it's a day where you wear, wear red and I can't think of it right now. Anyway, the point is your family has something to say about that kind of directs you into what you think about and what you notice and what traditions you have. So my family was pretty secular. Like I didn't go to church until I was an adult. I mean, I went to church here and there, but I didn't go, I didn't really do that because they couldn't decide. My dad was Catholic, my mom was Lutheran, and they couldn't decide what to do with me. So sometimes I go to Catholic church with my best friend when I was a little kid. And honestly, I didn't go because of, I was kind of jealous that she got to get, get the little wafer and I didn't get it. Uh, but I went there because I could be with her and I went to eat the donuts afterwards, honestly. So, you know, I didn't have that tradition and I didn't, I didn't create that any kind of tradition for, I later became um, converted to Catholicism later on, uh, but I didn't have that tradition until I became an adult. Okay. So my tradition over Christmas was um, my parents or my grandmother was a big baker and she lived with us, my mom's mom. And we had cookies. Now, if you remember, I'm an only child, right? So I had my mom, my dad, my grandmother, and me. We had enough cookies for the freaking whole neighborhood. We were like bakers from hell. We were, we were just, that's a tradition. So I don't eat wheat now. So finding a way to then have, keep my tradition alive during that holiday is going to be a real um, challenge for me because I like to have cookies during, during Christmas. Okay. I'm going to stop there and we're going to go to the next slide when we come back. And I'll see you soon.